cast for magic. We come to the Pope on Film podcast to laugh, to cry, to care, because we need that. All of us. That indescribable feeling we get, which I'm describing literally right now. So how describable are we talking about here? That indescribable feeling we get when the Liz a Day theme song begins to play and we go somewhere we've never been before. Not just entertained, but somehow reborn. <laughs> Dazzling images on a small Twitch stream, stream, sound that is sound, somehow, Amaland horse erotica feels good in a podcast like this. Bunny Williams feels like the stoned parts of us, and May Lynn feels perfect and powerful because here they are. The Pope on Film podcast. We make movies better. Welcome to the Bobon Film. I am Bunny Williams, and with me is Hey Bunny. Uh, on the screen, it says uh, the Pope on Film number four eighty. Another Roger Corman double feature, Little Shop of Horrors, and the Pit and the Pendulum. And then it says, "Just chatting, English movies, drugs, rock and roll, sexy boy." Are you the sexy boy? It says sexy boy, drugs, rock and roll. I'm just a bit confused. Yeah, yeah. I saw it as a keyboard. It sounded like a good one. Okay, yeah. You don't get We're to all put about your three own things. On Twitch, as far as I know, you don't get to put in your own fucking keywords. You pick them from a list. Huh. Okay, so you're... so. This podcast has always been about three things. Sexy boys, drugs, and rock and roll. I'm down with that. I'm okay with that. Uh, I am the Pope in question. My name is Reverend May Lynn. I am the founder of the Church of Ed Wood, which is an actual thing worth a Google. Somebody recently told me that, uh, <coughs> hey, uh, May Lynn, I'm not sure if you realize this, but... You're still listed as Reverend Steve on edwood.org. Maybe you want to update that. And it's like, bitch, that's a me that website's a museum at this point. Yeah. It is something that I don't want to touch, you know? It's like how the FBI has the entirety of the Unabomber shack in like a warehouse. Yeah. You know, I don't I, I don't want to touch it. It's pristine. It's in mint condition. So anyway, it's episode 480 of the podcast. Hello, everybody. If you haven't heard the big news here at the Pope on Film Studios, where we record in beautiful downtown sunny Kent, Ohio, we will sadly, tragically be ending this podcast in October, which will no doubt no doubt really upset our four fans yes they're gonna be so upset when they get out of the asylum 
but we will be ending the podcast on its 10-year anniversary. We'll be wrapping up the big show with a whole damn decade of doing it. Yes. 10 freaking years of making way too much content for any one person to listen to. Yeah. Without losing their grip on reality. We created this podcast so thick, like my lady parts, that the only acceptable way to really listen to it is to to listen to it in teams. Yeah. Of uh no less than no less than four people watching listening to different episodes at a time the pope on film podcast bringing people together you're welcome america yes dare i say you're welcome the world because we have huge recep eva deke fans yes we do here and see if you're just tuning and in there was hey. a time there was a time when we were huge in bulgaria yes and so uh see if you're just joining us you have no idea who recep eva deke is He's a major name in Turkish comedy, so really the only way to properly listen to this podcast is to start at the beginning, where our show was five seconds long, and continue listening to the podcast throughout uh, the middle part, where each episode was 30 hours long. Yes. And then get to this point so you can get all of our little jokes like Recep Ivadik and uh, TV's Jesse and Ray Milland horse erotica. It, the only way to hear yes. this podcast is to hear it from the beginning and then move your way through. So, Bonnie. Yes. This is something, this is something that I've been wanting to open the podcast with for quite some time. Also, um, I'm not just saying this because freaking Kevin. I'm not just saying this because it's a quote from the greatest TV show of all time. I think you should leave Robinson, but I am like the most you are lagging like hell. I've ever been in my life. Normally, I do like costume changes and stuff like that, and I dress all sexy. This is my outfit. I'm not changing. Oh, no. oh no! What's hell? Uh, shit. Funny. Yeah. Okay. Are you still there? I'm still here. You, okay. you were you were lagging like like a, you were lagging like a lot there for a little while. No, we had no idea huh? What you okay. Said. But but we're good now. Yeah, we seem good okay. now. Okay, good. That was weird. What I'm saying is I'm not changing my outfit. I'm tired. It's hot. I'm not changing my outfit. So I've been wanting to start the podcast like this for quite a while. A lot has happened in the ten years since we have started this podcast. Yes, we started recording in October of 2024 and 20. Of 2014. And we're ending it in October of 2024. But we started... We started in October of 2014. And... A lot of things happened... In the year 2014, Bunny. Oh, oh just in the 2014? I thought you were going for the span of time. Oh, you're frozen up again, I think. Or, or you're really, yeah, really, really concentrating. There you go. You woke up for a second. Uh, okay, good, good, good. Okay. Am, am I still good? Am I still good? You're, you're getting good. Am I funny? Huh? I'm you... getting good. Okay. Jeez Louise. Okay. Um. Okay. Well, we'll. Yeah. Maybe, maybe. Let me send you. 
No, let me send you – drop been, out and let me send you another invitation. So I'm confused as to uh, what else I can do to make this slower. Works. All right. We will be right back. And out. So in the meantime, how are you doing? Okay. We need we, we need some filler here. Oh, we need some filler here. We're waiting yeah. for her to come back. I was, I was screaming. Yes. A little rock of horse. Yes. Of horse. But it was probably trademarked, huh? Uh, copyrighted? Oh, for Co sure. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I won't sing it anymore. Um, but I did watch the movies, and they were both really fun. Yeah. Yes. I enjoyed Good. them both. Roger Corman is an evil genius. Is an evil genius. Yes. And, <coughs> and I believe everything Ed Wood wanted to be. Yeah. Yeah. Making well, money. We, we making will films. ask the Pope when she gets back. Yeah. Do you think she's going to come back? Oh. Here we are. Hmm. Hi. Hey. Hi. Hopefully that good? helps. Am I good? Yeah. You're good so good? far. Yay. All right then. So, I can continue. Yes. Okay. 2014 is when we started this podcast, and oh goodness gracious, so many things have happened between then and now. 2014 was the year that the first Guardians of the Galaxy movie came out. Yes. And it was really fun to see, yet again, the typical uh, media response to the Guardians of the Galaxy. No one knows these superheroes. I didn't. Marvel with a huge gamble. Yeah. Man, will this be... A major failure for the MCU? I mean, they said that about Thor. They yeah. said that about Iron Man. And so it's always interesting to see. I mean, nowadays when they say that, it, it actually is true. But yeah, now they're then, right. Yeah. yeah, now they're right. Uh, the first John Wick movie came out in 2014. Now they're on like... Oh, no. Oh, no. Yeah. And they're doing spin offs. No. Uh, the first Lego movie, I remember. Yeah. That's ridiculous. Gangnam Style was a big hit. Uh, that was also the year that all of those celebs did that uh, celebrity selfie at the Oscars. And the Oscars that year was hosted by Ellen because she was still tolerable. Yeah. And so that's exciting. That was a long time ago. And then I was going to stop it right there. But I found two astounding things. Two absolutely bizarre batshit things that happened in 2014 that I have to mention. In fact, these either one of these would be an awesome... Uh, historic approximation if we were still doing that. Nowadays, I try my hardest to uh, make the show quick and easy to write. So, I have to mention these. In 2014, 7439289X like X-ray. Sorry, go ahead. What the are you doing, like, secret we, we, Russian codes? We got, a, we got a call. It was the president. He wanted the launch code. So we have, eh, we might be cutting oh, this show a little okay. on the short side, but go ahead. Okay. Uh, in 24 since in prison, and he was all set to marry his 
very long term girlfriend. I, yeah. I can't imagine that Charles Manson can get a uh, girlfriend in his neighborhood. But sadly, tragically, the wedding was canceled. And you wouldn't believe why, Bonnie. You wouldn't believe it. Um, Charles Manson's 26-year-old bride-to-be, a woman named Afton E. Burton. Are you still hearing me? Yes. Bonnie. Yeah. Still okay. hearing you. Good, You're not good, moving good. so Did well. Did I but freeze up again? You. Oh, you've been freezing up a lot. Okay, good. We're just, well, we're just going to trudge through. Yeah, okay. Well, but you can still hear me? Yes. But you can still hear me? Yes. Okay, well then, I don't care if I'm freezing up. Okay. So, uh, Char Charles Manson's wedding was canceled after it was learned that his 26-year-old bride-to-be, a woman named Afton Burr, so that upon his death, she could legally take possession of his corpse and turn his body into a tourist attraction, a la famed Western bandit Elmer fucking McCurdy. Really? Yes! The return of Elmer McCurdy. Yeah. Can you imagine uh, Charles Manson in a sequel to the Elmer McCurdy story? Isn't that crazy? I can yeah. see people traveling far and wide to check out Charles Manson's corpse. I, 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 yeah, I remember that story, and I remember thinking, yeah, that was pretty smart of her. Fuck it. Yeah. Well, I mean, are, are we going to cry that she's like somehow ripping off or defaming Charles Manson? Yeah. How dare you attack Charles Manson? Like, how dare you try and take Charles Manson? Here's the sad part. So you're going to marry uh, Charles Manson because you know further down the line there's going to be a paycheck. I I'm good with that. Yeah, I'm fine with that too. The sad part is I know that m most of America was finally hoping that Charles Manson could settle down and get his happily ever after. Yeah. But unfortunately... You know, dang, shucky darns. Looks like he won't be settling down after all. Okay, so that's the first and story. You know and now people pe are fucking nuts with Manson. Yes. And, and honestly, honestly, I, I had a realization. Like, if you go back, because, like, everybody had kind of their Manson phase, right? Mm -hmm. I'm sure you spent some at least a little time Googling Manson videos on YouTube. I mean, I you read the have. book. I read the book, Elter Skelter. If you listen to Charles Manson talk, which stupid people think is deep, <laughs> okay, and why yeah. Manson still has a cult following, you listen to Charles Manson talk, and I always found this fascinating of just how much fucking gibberish it is. Yeah. Charles Manson sounds exactly how Trump sounds now. Yeah, pretty much. Pretty much. Bing bong boom. Yeah, it's just it's just gibberish and words that do not connect and do not mean anything that stupid people think is deep. The thing that kill the thing that 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 blows my mind is that Charles Manson just spent most of his life locked up in jail and he didn't kill anybody that finds it, i'm fascinated yeah. by that yeah that it's like oh he's locked up because he told other people to kill yeah and it's like oh okay charles manson di just didn't stab didn't shoot didn't torture anybody no like at all that's fascinating to me that's fascinating Okay, so that's the first story. Charles Manson and Elmer McCurdy. Here's the second story. The Netherlands. Okay. You know the <coughs> Netherlands, Bunny? I have heard of them. Yes, it, it's the home of the Netherlandians. Yeah. 
in their city, Netherlands City. That, that's the capital of the Netherlands. So in 2014, the Netherlands proved that they're a million times better than America because they instituted a huge tax specifically targeting the ultra-rich. Yeah. Can you imagine Ooh, that yeah. in America? It that's like a dream on par with in America taxing the rich is like a fantasy. I mean, you might as well wish that the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe was real. Yeah, you know. Can you imagine? Can you believe how much better our country would be if we taxed the ultra wealthy? Instead of literally letting them control every facet of American life. Yes. It's fucked up. So but, twenty but points. We can't do anything about it because they literally control every aspect of American life. Yeah. See, they that's make the, the laws problem. and that's yeah, why no. we can't do anything about them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's fucked up. So twenty points to the Netherlandites. That's a boss move. So they passed a new wealth tax in 2014. You won't believe the name. The name of the tax? Yes. Oh. It's a big, long Dutch name, and it's pronounced Dagobert Duck Tax. Okay. And they named this new tax Dagobert Duck Tax. Here's the thing. Dagobert, yeah, is the Dutch name for fucking Scrooge McDuck. Oh, that is so fucking cool! It's the Scrooge McDuck tax. Yes. Oh, and it and it's all one word: Dagobert Duck tax. Tax spelled T A K S. Dagobert Duck Tax. In 2014, the word Dagobert Duck Tax was like the Dutch word of the, of the year. Basically, the Dutch said, hey, if you're as rich as Scrooge McDuck, we're taking some of your money because it's fucked up that you have so much when there are homeless people in the Netherlands. And so that's what a good nation does. Yes. You know, I, I love the fact that there's a, like, a DuckTales tax, basically. I think that's awesome. Also in 2014, I was a sad, suicidal man who was back then as close as I've ever been to a divorce. Uh, and you to... were Jewish. And it was Jewish? You, you can't leave out. Oh, yes, yes, no. I was yeah. a Jewish man. I was really into uh, Tai Chi. Yeah. And scrapbooking. And scrapbooking. And primarily, you know, just getting out of my motorcycle, getting out of my hog, and just riding. You know? Yeah. Just me and the open road. Uh, it, it, it was amazing. So, to say this in a nice way, Natasha was spending a lot of time in another state, and I was spending a number of nights somewhere else. Yeah. I had a divorce lawyer, but I kept postponing the meeting with the divorce lawyer because I was still blindly holding out hope that uh, my wife and I could work things out. Yeah. Uh, and it's, you say, hey, here's my phone number, call me up. Even though we had never spoken before, and you said, I found a real easy way to record a podcast. I'm recording like 800 of them. Yeah. And uh, how about we do one? I've got a great name. It's called The Pope on Film, and I remember thinking, that's a horrible fucking name, but okay. <laughs> it's not like we're going to be doing the show for 10 whole years. I'm sure it's going to be fine. And we didn't have the internet, so probably like the first year that I did the podcast, I would go to Dwayne and Lauren's house and wheeze their juice yeah. as far as the internet is concerned. 
I would be recording the podcast in like my brother-in-law's house uh, before he lost his mind. And they are so not together anymore. But by the time 2015 rolled around, my wife had an about face, and so did I. Even, even There were times in 2014 when we hated each other and we were going to break up and we talked about like, like which kid would want to go where, and it was pretty dark, but yeah, we we were still friends. And 2015, you know, my wife and I turned things around, and we we took each other seriously, and we rebuilt our relationship. And eventually, my wife shockingly still can't believe this. But my wife said, I love you, honey. <clears throat> How about one more kid? Yeah. And boom, we had Eleanor, and Eleanor will be turning eight years old tomorrow. This podcast is older than my youngest child. Yes. I find that fascinating. So you've known Isn't that crazy, Bonnie? Yes. Did you hear that? That's amazing. It's impressive that, you know, we went 10 years and somehow Maxwell and Eleanor did not score a spinoff. Yes. But there were a few spinoffs. There was uh, the break time hijinks with Jeannie and Q. Yes. Q's break time hijinks. And I think... Day and Destiny had a show for like a like a, a hot minute. second. Yeah. A New York minute. Woo-hoo! Destiny has since blocked me on Facebook. Not that I'm upset by that at all. And my wife did an episode an episode of her own. Not the full episode. I did like the intro and the uh historic approximations, but she did the main movie at the end. It was Wally. Yeah. The Wally episode. My wife took that episode way more seriously than I thought she would. That episode was 87 hours. Yes, it was. It was incredible. My wife had like eight pages of notes. The episode was literally, I would say, about five hours long. It was intense. Then uh, other things that happened it, during the 10 years, uh, I was fired from... Uh, from Barnes and Noble after 18 years, because in 2018, in a desperate attempt to stay in business, they fired 1,800 full-time employees, including me. I was immediately picked up by a nonprofit in Norman, Oklahoma, called LoveWorks Leadership, and the founder of LoveWorks and I created a free monthly kids story time called Raising Little Leaders. And it was centered around me reading stories, and it was a lot of fun. And at the exact three-year anniversary of me doing one to two story times a month for Love Wars, the moment I started transitioning and posting pictures of myself in a dress, suddenly this nonprofit was like, oh, you know what? Uh, We have budget issues, and I was let go. And so I didn't perform for about two years. And then I saw in 2023 that there were auditions for this big three-day Pride Festival in downtown Oklahoma City. And I auditioned, and I've been performing since then again, which has been really nice. Here's the thing. I did the math, and I find this absolutely fascinating. All of last year... I did seven performances throughout the entirety of the year. Yeah. This year, so far, I have done 21 performances. Nice. Ten in the morning. Including ten, including eight just this month. My eighth is going to be this Saturday on the main stage of uh, the three-day Oklahoma City Pride Festival. Last year, they put me on Sunday, and that's the day 
when they put people i i'm i'm just using my own words here but it seems as if sunday is where they put the people where they're not sure if it's going to be a big hit and so it was me and a ballet company and a like so sis at rock band as far so as I can tell. you were you were a february movie yes very much so but this year they put me in on the main stage on saturday which is there's going to be like 800 900 i don't know a thousand people there and they have a bunch of big names that are performing that saturday night but my hour long they gave me a half hour last year my hour long set will be between 3 30 and 4 30 which will be like the peak time when people are coming in and it's a big deal and it's this saturday and i'm really excited we have been through a lot yes in this podcast And, of course, all the things that you have gone through in the past 10 years, Bonnie. Uh, let's see. You finally got clean. Am I locking up again? You Hear are locking all? up again. You're, you're over it. Okay. okay. So sick of this. I don't know what the problem is. I might have to move into my wife's room for this. to be closer to the internet. But we have been through a lot in these past nine and, let's say, two-thirds years. And now we're ending it. And the thing that I will miss the most about the Pope on Film podcast, besides the groupies, of course. Yeah. Because we get so many Pope on Film groupies that are just throwing themselves all over us. And I'm like, hey, Liam Hemsworth, no. I'm holding out for Chris. You know? Yeah. So, um, the thing I'll miss the most is just having a regularly, regularly date sketching stupid with you, Bunny. Yes. I have no problem saying this, Bunny. I love you. You, uh, these past 10 years, you've been more of my father than my father had been my father, and you've been more of my brother than my actual father. Horrible, racist, drunken. It's broken. You done. You done locked up real good this time. You broke him. Woman beating brother. You are my dad and my brother and a part of my legit family, and I love you. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Can you? Can you hear me? I can hear you now. Yeah. Jesus. Yeah. Christ. Got him crying over here. Okay. Are you crying? Well, cause like it, it, you locked hard, okay? Yeah. Where what was the was, last thing you heard? You were completely frozen. Well, apparently I heard everything, cause as soon as you unlocked, I got everything that you had said while you were locked. Really wow. speed it up. Okay. Wow. Okay. Well, so that's the exactly Alvin, how I the planned chipmunk it. The chipmunk version of it, I kind of heard. Nice. Nice. Okay. Well, that was my plan this whole time. Was to Alvin and the Chipmunk my feelings for you. Yes. So that's good. That's what I plan. So uh, I love you, Bunny. And uh, 10 years. Isn't that incredible? Yeah. 10 years. I have mapped out our summer. Our entire summer and the movies that we will be doing. Okay. We will be ending our summer of Corman with possibly the greatest double feature of all time. Okay. The Godfather Part 2 and Looney Tunes back in action. Uh-oh. 
both featuring Rob Roger Corman. What a great double feature. Finally, Looney Tunes and the Corleone family together. Well, but we're still going to be doing Santa Claus and the Ice Cream Bunny, aren't yes. we? Yes, I would like to do that. And we could have a couple of other specials. We could kick that idea around, like maybe an Academy yeah. Awards special show or something like that. Things of that nature. Yeah, that would be fun. Something that we just do yeah. from time then, to time. And then for a, yeah, and then I figure in like September no more I'll pick four. the movies in a, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. In September I'll pick the movie, and then in October you can pick the movies. I you can pick whatever you want, but for my last month, September. I am going to pick movies that we've done in the past that I feel are important. Okay. I can't promise that I won't pick cats. Uh-oh. I'm just saying it's on the table. I'm not saying all we're right, going to right. do it. The only uh, movie the only movie that I'm sure we're going to do is The Giant Claw. Beyond okay. that, anything else is up in the t- uh, is in the cards. I'll see your cats and raise you speed racer. Ooh, well, that's pretty good. <laughs> that's a decent movie. But uh, I believe that's it for our opening this week. The Betty White Memorial Podcast segment brought to you by Raid Shadow Legends. Download today, a.k.a. Jeff. Uh, so what I think that we should do is we should take a break. Show we some videos and stuff like that. And then, after that, we can get to our double feature, Little Shop of Horrors and the Pit and the Pendulum. Yeah. We've gotten into price territory. Oh, I love it. Yes. Which I am very excited about. Love it. Vincent Price always seemed to me to be the gayest straight man I've ever Uh, yeah, until George Hamilton took his crown. Because, but yeah, from what I, I can tell, with that. yeah, but the what from what I, yeah, but like he's just this spooky, effeminate British man who loves his wife and really enjoys cooking, and it's just, yes. mm, I can see a little bit of the gayness, but but apparently he's he was straight, so. We're, we're just going to Liberace that one, okay? Yeah. We're, yeah. we're just going to know yeah. he's just flamboyant. Yeah. So uh, so maybe we should take a break. Should we take a break? We should take a break. Okay, I concur. We will be right back with more of the Popon film after this. do 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 and break. Toadstools, it's me, Adam, fucking alien. If you come to Theta Prime B, you'll be treated like family. Just family we don't like very much. There's a cheap hotel downtown, only five grand a month. It's kind of a rough area, so bring a gun. Just don't let anybody see you with a gun. We'll shoot you if they think you have a gun. Straight with you. No judgment here. If you find yourself in the mood for a hooker, do yourself a favor and stick to your body parts. I mean, we're all crudded up to one degree even or another. Oh, keep in mind, one in five people here are raving fucking lunatics. So don't talk to anyone. Don't ask anyone for the time. Don't mention the weather. And for the love of God, don't make eye contact with anyone. You're probably going to want to bring your own food. Eating here is kind of like Russian roulette. Some places claim to be government inspected, but with a failing government, what does that mean? 
Kentucky boy. Maybe don't come here. Instead, how about you watch these videos from Undead Cow Studios and the Pope on Film. Croissant. 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 So, I'm going to show you one of my favorite books in the world, and it's right here, and it's called Heaven is Real and Fun by Kim Robinson, and then here's the subtitle. It actually says, you don't float around wearing diapers and eating grapes. I love this book so much. This woman believes that, like literally believes and when she prays, Jesus takes her from earth and lets her play in heaven. Uh, here's what the back says. Since 1988, the Holy Spirit has been taking me to heaven. Jesus would show me various fun places and allowed me to do fun things. I asked, why, ha why was he showing me these places? Daddy slash God said... Because people think all they do here is float around wearing diapers, eating grapes. They're doing nothing but bowing before me. Okay. So this is my favorite passage of the book. And it's called Play Gel Balls. Okay. I'm not sure if this... Hold on. I'm going to do this in two parts. Okay. Are you ready for this? This morning while worshipping... I was caught up in the spirit and stepped over into heaven when I heard Jesus say, come play gel balls. It's like a water balloon, but the ball is full of giggly joy gel. You can squeeze it into yourself. When you put one in yourself, you laugh intensely. You're in the, in the spirit realm. You can place things into yourself as if you were transparent. When you try to hit the other person with these joy gel balls, they try to get hit. So it will go into them, and they will intensely laugh. They can also catch it and squeeze it into themselves. Intensely laugh and keep playing. Heaven is so fun, and filled with intense laughter. This reminded me of Job 8.21 that says, He will yet fill your mouth with laughter, and your lips with joyful shouting. Hello there. Yeah, so anyway, I love this book. I love this book so much, and a lot of people have asked me, why do you love this book so much? And, and the thing that I love about this book is that it, this isn't a joke. This person actually believes... Uh, chapter 2, Daddy, God, and the Holy Spirit in Heaven. It, this woman actually believes that she can leave Earth and travel to Heaven where she has a vaguely uh, a high sexual tension relationship with Jesus. There's a passage in here where she's slow dancing with Jesus fragrance of Jesus like this woman wants to bang our Lord and Savior and I, I just love this I, I just Jesus is in me Jesus is in me this woman wants to bang Christ and I just love this book because if 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 you're on the street and you're pushing a shopping cart and the police ask you what's up with you and you say, oh, I, I, I've been talking to Jesus. He takes me. He takes me to, uh, to roller coasters. Roller coasters in heaven. You don't uh, just float around on a cloud wearing divers and eating grapes. Then you'd be put in an institution or a prison and you'd rot in there for the rest of your life. But if you're an old white woman and you say those things, then uh, congratulations, you're a prophet. It's it's insane. This woman is clearly insane. Hey, everybody, it's me, Mickey Mouse. Say, you want to come inside? You want to come inside? You want to come inside? Oh, my God! Wow!
Wanna see a real weasel? Elon fucking Musk. The trust fund baby born with a silver spoon in his mouth who considers himself a self-made man thinks he's too good to pay taxes. Yeah, this stupid Tony Stark who cosplays as a working class hero had the balls to say, if they come for my money, they'll be coming for yours next. Like, we haven't been getting fisted by this government's infinity gauntlet for the last four decades. Bitch, don't dare pretend to be one of us if you can't even pay your taxes. But then again, we wouldn't name our kids this. Whatever the fuck this is. Christ's sake. We feel you, little... this. That's a large lump of selfish piece of shit. And we suffer along with you, little man. He'll have us all killed as soon as we're finished building his life supporting dome city. At least you'll have your therapist to dump all of the vitriolic bile you built up towards a narcissistic father who doesn't know how to show love. Eat the rich. And now, please enjoy this video from our good friend. Liz a day. She pays taxes. I think I'm gonna procrastinate a little bit more Oh, oh, oh Hitting up and strings without my right hand Using my left hand singing I need to quit singing so I can start drinking Here I go Dark in the city, night is a while. Steam in the subway, the world is on fire. Woman, you won't make give me a sign. Catch my breathing, even closer behind. Touch 
touch with the ground I'm on a hot down after you I smell like a sound I'm lost in a crowd And I'm hungry like I was Across the line A discord and rhyme I'm on a hunt down after you My mouth is alive With juices and wine And I'm hungry like I was <laughs> Stuck in the forest, too close behind To be a bum, you by the moonlight side do, 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 Have a drum made on your skin so tight You feel my heat, I'm just a moment behind do, 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 And touch with the ground I'm on a hunt down after you I smell like a sign I'm lost and I'm found And I'm hungry like the world I'm straight out of the line I discord and rhyme Howling and whining after you My mouth is alive I'm running inside And I'm hungry like the world It's discord and rhyme Cause I'm on a hunt down after you My mouth is alive With juices and wine I'm on a hungry like the wolf Burn in the crowd Break from the crowd I'm on a hunt down after you I sent it the sound I'm lost and I'm found And I'm hungry like the wolf Crunch the line A discord and rhyme I'm on a hunting after you My mouth is alive I run inside And I'm hungry like the wolf Oh no I bust a sweat doing that song <sighs> That deserves a drink Don't mind if I do so until next week, this is so wrong. Who got a problem with me? Bum, bum, no, 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 no. Who got a problem with me? Bum, bum. Take it easy, Dracula. What do you think I'm carrying here, my dirty laundry? Where a man-eating talking plant gives homicide something to think about. And I didn't do it. Do what? Whatever. Ever see this man? Man, see picture of him. Why are you so nervous? <laughs> Boy, you kiss good, Audrey. Oh, I guess I just have a good kisser. Now you will do as I say. Yes, master. You will go out and find me some food. Yes, master. What's the matter? Don't you like me? Too bony. Too bony? Nobody ever told me that before. Beef is better than veal. Ah. Uh. You're such a dodo. What do you call this? Chopped liver?
father's world, Mr. Barnett. The shrieking of mutilated victims became the music of his life. The blood of a thousand men and women was spilled within these walls. Limbs twisted and broken, flesh burned black. <laughs> Starring <laughs> Vincent Price, truly a master of the macabre. John Carr in a challenging role. Barbara Steele, more blood chilling than in Black Sunday. And introducing taunting Luana Anders. Nicholas. Is that you? Elizabeth? While we were up here mourning her, she was alive. Struggling to be free. The you are lying, sir! When Maria screamed, where were you? You lie! I'm going to torture you, Isabella. I'm going to make you suffer for your faithlessness to me. <laughs> you harlot! All the violence of angry seas. The unseen forces of the unknown. The unforgettable memories of a long forgotten childhood. All these you will feel in your very blood. Do you know where you are, Bartholomew? You are about to enter hell. Storytime with Mei Lin, a one-of-a-kind, hyperactive and interactive blend of adult stand-up comedy and children's story time because you're never too old for a good story. Mei Lin is going on tour in 2024 and after much deliberation, they have chosen the following wildly original name for their tour, Storytime with Mei Lin on tour, a one former man show. Brought to you in part by Spite. Don't miss your chance to see her on tour before Republicans ban her, just like they're busy banning all history books and, for that matter, books books. For more information on Mei Lin, like, I don't know, try Google maybe, or Bing if you're a weirdo. Hey, is Ask Jeeves still a thing? Probably not. Oh well. Storytime with Mei Lin. And we're back! With more of the Pope on film. The Pope on film after dark. <laughs> Welcome to my boudoir where you can see all of my sexy accoutrements, such as my spirit Halloween pillow and the glasses and cell phone holder my wife crocheted. Ah. This is where the magic happens. So, 
It's time, Bunny! It's time! It's time! Yes, Bunny, my friend who is more than brother to me, I embrace thee, because it is time once again for all of us here at the Pope on Film to gritty our way into the second half of our big show. And it is second half, where it is said second half, wherein we finally, inoventually get around to discussing our all new director's cut digitally remastered and now with 20 minutes of never before seen footage movie of the week and this week we continue our summer of roger corman with a very cheap double feature of b movies little shop of horrors from 1960 and the pit and the pendulum from 1961 dramatic music Dun, dun, dun. This week, our third week into our very cheap Roger Corman summer. Yes. We make it out of the 50s and head into the colorful swinging 60s with our double feature. And this is a good one. These are two that were, um, as opposed to most Roger Corman films, these two were actually successful. So... The first film that we will be talking about is Little Shop of Horrors. And um, the only... This film is Thor and a bucket of blood is Loki. Yes. Most people know Thor. Oh, man, Thor. And he's all handsome and, and this and that. But also, he's kind of one-dimensional. Now, there's a lot of depth in Loki. And Loki's sort of like a fan favorite. And there's a lot going on there. But people know Thor more. Yes. Little Shop of Horrors is Thor. A Bucket of Blood is Loki. So Roger Corman did A Bucket of Blood. He finished it early. And they were like, okay, here, if you want something in here, there you go. Okay, and so Roger, or and so the the studio was all like, "Okay, we're destroying these sets in two days," and yeah. and Roger Corman's like, two days? I can make a movie in two days," and so he quickly threw together a movie, and in the two days before the sets were tore down, he made another film. And that is this film, Little Shop of Horrors. But now, how much, it when it comes to Roger Corman, like, how much of these stories are we actually to be, are we to believe? Excuse me, excuse me, but Seymour's house is obviously Walter Paisley's room that he rents from Mrs. Swicket. No, no, okay, so, no, fine, yeah. But and then they at the had end, the script going. He didn't put a whole fucking movie together in two days. That script is uh, genius for Little Shop of Horrors. He did not yeah. crank this out in an hour on the toilet. No, no, no. That's that's the thing. Like the rumor is like, oh, he filmed this movie in two days. No, in the two days that the sets were still available, he filmed all of the interior shots. That I can accept. Yeah, so that makes a lot which more is sense. still which is still impressive, very impressive. You know, let's not get it wrong, but but that's Roger Corman. You you always have to try to separate the bullshit from the reality. Yeah, but you can clearly see, like they've made the living room area of Walter Paisley's room that he rents yeah to look different but then there's one scene where he goes into the kitchen it is 100 percent the kitchen where bert convy was dripping into a saucepan 100 <laughs> percent. and also yeah uh when, at the end when they're chasing seymour in the same way that they chased Walter Paisley after they figured out about his sculptures. 
Uh, so they're running to catch Seymour, and Seymour ends up in a warehouse, and it's the exact same warehouse that uh, fucking Walter Paisley used that thing to cut off the guy. Internet connection is unstable. Maybe it's me. Maybe I'm unstable. Yeah. We already knew that? Ouch. Yeah, that is what I think, Matt. Am I good now? You're good now. Okay, good. The so, warehouse. You you kind of in the warehouse. Oh yeah, the warehouse is the warehouse at the end that Seymour runs into is the same warehouse where Walter Paisley cut off that guy's head with the saw. Yeah. And speaking of Walter Paisley, it's time once again for Dick Watch 2024. Yes. Our man, the king of the character actors, Mr. Dick Miller, appears three minutes into this film as the guy who eats flowers. And I want to stop and talk about this. Originally, Dick Miller was going to play Seymour, but he dropped out. And I kind of understand it because at the time he was in his like late 20s and he yeah. didn't want to be typecast as like this wimpy bookworm nerdish guy. Because basically, Seymour is just the exact same person as Walter Paisley. And he didn't yeah. want to be typecast, and I understand that. He got a part where he does kind of look dashing, and he's in it a lot. And, you know, he comes in in his nice suits, and he's eating flowers. It's, it's yeah. a memorable part. Oh, but he is not just eating flowers, man. He is fucking selling it. You know, they're, they're yeah, having he is. conversations all around. He's just standing oh. there eating the flowers. Yeah. It's his idea to, uh, if he, if Dick Miller wasn't in this movie, Seymour would have been fired, end of film. Nobody would have died. Yeah. So, if anything, Dick Miller starts this whole thing, this whole movie going. So, so he plays a cool, good-looking plant eater that gets the whole ball rolling, but there is an alternate universe out there where Dick Miller did star in A Bucket of Blood and Little Shop of Horrors back to back. And in my mind, that kick started the Dick Miller cinematic universe. Oh. Kind of like how Kelton the Cop was in three Ed Wood movies. Yes. I can imagine Roger Corman making A Bucket of Blood and then making Little Shop of Horrors and having both of them a success and then saying, like Roger Corman would, People like Dick Miller as a murderous weirdo. That's all I'm making now. Yeah. And I could see him making like four, five, six, seven other Walter Paisley type movies starring Dick Miller. Yeah. Absolutely. So, like, I, I think I can see that and I can see Little Shop of Horrors being better because Dick Miller is starring in it. Yeah. 100%. Odd fact, this was turned into a musical, obviously. And they made a movie in the 80s starring Canadian treasure Rick Moran. Yes. That movie was the first time that Bill Murray and Steve Martin were in a movie together. Really? Okay. That feels wrong in my head. But yeah, that was the first time they were ever in a movie together. Huh, yeah. Blows my mind. It is weird. It see, is weird. I, I see it more like between this and the movie are just two different things. Yes. And I feel they're both very good in their own right. You know? Yeah. I mean, yeah. I kind of have a soft, a soft spot for the musical again, from growing up in New York and seeing commercials for the off-Broadway play. Yeah. You know, so like, little shop, that, that's like ingrained into me. Yeah. But I, the only song from the Little Shop of Horrors musical that I like is fucking Steve Martin's Dentist song. Yeah. That is 
fucking golden. I love it. That's one of my favorite musical numbers. Yeah. Of all time is Steve Martin being, you'll be a dentist. Love that. But they had a cut a out fan of the musical. a lot of gold from the they original They cut movie out a lot. To, to make room for the music. Yeah, here's a couple of the things that they cut out. The Dragnet impersonators. The what? The Dragnet impersonators. Yes. Like, they're narrating this original film. They are nowhere in it. Um, and number two, here's another thing that's missing from the musical. The intense racism. Yes. Because number one, Mr. Mr. Mushnik's accent is essentially Dr. Zoidberg from Futurama. Okay. Doctor, Mr. Mushnik is just a Jewish crustacean from space. Period. Okay. And then the old Jewish woman who always has family members die, and I looked this up. Her name, her character's name is yes. City Shiva. I oh, I love that. And that's racist as fuck. Why is that racist? Why why it, are why it, are you calling Jewish comedy racist? And so her name is City Shiva and she goes they, to funerals all the like time. It. Yeah. I don't like it. I don't like it. I Yeah. One thing that I love about the musical is that you see the plant in the movie and it's, you know, black and white and it's small. Yeah. And then it opens it in its mouth and then it says, Rainbow. And it's like, that boy sucks. Yeah. When I think of Little Shop of Horrors, I think of the black and white movie. I still hear Audrey as an awesome black person. Yes. That is the voice of Audrey. Yes. Two. In this, it's Audrey Jr. But this movie is a classic. A cheap-ass classic. An odd, strangely written classic with, with an ending. The ending of this movie reminds me of the the movie yesterday in that Roger Corman has written himself into a wall. Yeah. He has no way how to get out of it. And here is the way that they've, that they've decided to end this film. And it's not perfect. It, yeah. Did I lock up again? Uh, kind of, sort of. Okay. You can, you can hear me though. Yeah. Okay. Uh, also, I don't know which version you saw, because there's a billion versions out there, but I found a colorized version on YouTube, and I watched that. It is the worst fucking colorization I have ever seen. Yeah. It is fucking horrible. I liked it because it was in high definition, and a lot of times with these old movies, it can be difficult to find like a high-definition version of the film. So I liked how highly defined it was, but if someone, someone's in color, they touch their hand, and the place where their hand is, like the background is now black and white. Oh, okay. it's really weird. Yeah, it is. It is fascinating to look at, if for no other reason, to see how weird and bad their uh, colorization is. But that's it for Little Shop of Horrors. We all know the the story of that. I do like the original ending to the musical. They spent one million dollars on the ending to Little Shop of Horrors, but because the ending is everyone gets eaten, the plant becomes a success, they take over America, and now everyone's dying. Watch out for the plants. Credits. Uh, audiences fucking hated it, 
So they created a happy ending to the musical at the last second. Yeah. But you can still go on YouTube and watch the end, the original ending, which is amazing to watch because, yeah, they spent a million dollars on this one musical number and then they had to cut it. Wow. Yeah. But a, there, when you go and see the play, a lot of times people are shocked because like, oh, no, the plant's about to eat Seymour. Seymour's going to free himself. Seymour's going to save the day. Seymour's fucking dead? <laughs> Damn! And the end of the play is the song, Beware of the Plants. And this entire movie has just been like a public service announcement warning you about the fact that these plants are now taking over America and killing everyone and watch out for the plants. Yeah. Yeah, it's totally different. So, that's Little Shop of Horrors. Our second film. Ladies and gentlemen, we got him. Yes. Vincent Boom Boom Price. Vinny Price. Everybody's got a Vincent Price for the Million Dollar Man, Ted DiBiase. Yeah. Vinny Price in an Eddie Allen Poe horror costume drama. Just inject this shit directly into my veins. Yeah. Fucking love it. This was the second of eight Edgar Allan Poe adaptations that Corman cranked out between 1960 and 1964. I want to be clear about that. Eight Edgar Allan Poe adaptations in five years. Yeah. That is insane. Yeah, and, and of course, each one was even more unfaithful to the source material as the last one. Yeah. But all of these uh, Edgar Allan Poe movies were critical and commercial hits, which is odd to hear the words Roger Corman and hit film in the same sentence. Oh, don't blame me there. Yeah. But but here we are. And I find that fascinating. This movie was so cheap. How cheap was it? Thank you. That they didn't have the money in the budget to build any sets. So they rented and borrowed sets from other major studios and as far as i can tell they didn't do this but in my heart of hearts roger corman stole some of this shit from other studios <laughs> a la ed wood well Chris, they also, this one, can make though, it. the legend had always had it is that roger corman had Bought a castle that is so not that he could make case. all of these fucking castle movies. What? So he can make all of these movies in a spooky castle and get it to pay for itself. Yeah. Huh. So yeah, uh, I can totally see Roger Corman stealing candelabras and tapestries from Universal Studios. Yeah. Like, uh, just like in Ed Wood. Fun fact: the doctor in this. Dr. Leon, Dr. Leon, that's played by Anthony Carbone. He owned the yellow door in oh. a bucket of blood. Oh, 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 okay. He was the owner guy who, as far as I'm concerned, in a bucket of blood, is just as complicit in Walter Paisley's murders. Yes. As Walter Paisley was. So I like the fact that he's in this. I love about the blood. So originally, uh, Dick Miller was going to star in this film as the pendulum. <laughs> but he did not want to be typecast as medieval torture devices, which I understand. I get that. But I think it would have been much better of, with, uh, with with Dick Miller's slight Brooklyn accent, 
Fuck yeah. Yeah. As the pendulum. There is a lot of uh, discussions that I'm skipping. We could talk about uh, how the fact that the music composer is a big time musician that invented the genre of exotica music. Really? Okay. Basically, he invented tiki music all by himself. It, it, the guy who did the music for this is a big ass deal. And then the screenwriter was Richard Matheson. Yeah. That I is saw that. that is huge. And then of course Barbara Steele. Holy shit. Yeah. She was the queen of British scream queens. Yeah, except I don't think she I I, I she doesn't really quite fit scream queen where I think she plays better with the boys. You know, I I really have her on an equal level with Vincent Price or Boris Karloff or and I agree with that. But uh that's what they called her on with Oh, I'm sure they did. Yeah. Uh but yeah, she's amazing. Luna. Luna. You are not you're not getting a spin-off. We're wrapping up this podcast. It's not going to be the Luna show. Jeannie and Luna's break time hijinks over here. <laughs> she's trying to get she's trying to get a spin-off. It's like it's Q all over again. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's that's what did it. So fun fact, Bunny. Yeah. Uh the main reason, and this was discovered later. The main reason why Dick Miller dropped out of being the pendulum in 1961's The Pit and the Pendulum is because after Little Shop of Horrors, Dick Miller developed a severe plant eating addiction. Oh, that'll happen. You know, and that that ruins lives. Yeah. You know, you get addicted to eating plants. And next thing you know, you're sucking dick for a uh, marigold money. And it's it all starts with the dandelions out in the yard. Mm hmm. I wonder if we so, are you now. Know, the... So, so fuck the bees. It's the bees or our children. Yeah. Yeah. And you know what, bees? I don't like jazz. You want to grow? Now? You want to oh. grow dandelions for your precious little pollinators? You can suck on my pollinators, and our children are just gonna start eating them. They're gonna start eating think... dandelions. Then they're gonna move <clears throat> up to carnations. You know the, the and next the kids thing you know, they're drinking into tea, heavy metal like music. Will eat the roses. Yep, it's 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 sad. It's sad. Bunny, do you, there's, I think now, there is a good chance that we have made history as the first podcast to say the sentence, to say the phrase, sucking dick for dandelion. Yes. Pretty sure that uh, my brother, my brother and me, and welcome to Night Vale, have never said this phrase before. No. So we're kind of historical. Bunny, do you we want still hold to hold the record for saying church organist? Yes, we do. Like we even said that more than the short lived podcast. Church organists. Yes. Weekly. Yes. Last week tonight with church organists. Bunny, do you want to hit us with the plot of the pit and the pendulum? It's a difficult okay, one. Okay, so uh, this is, oh, God, what is even the time period? Kind of a medieval, possibly Renaissance-ish, going Ish. by the roughs uh, yeah. period. And we watch a guy ride in a carriage for a long time while we roll credits. 
and he comes to Vincent Price's castle. Vincent yeah. Price, this guy turns out to be Vincent Price's wife's brother who has come because his sister has died. Yeah. Vincent Price's wife. Uh, man, I had really a hard time with the stories they were telling this guy. And, and there, there were numerous flashbacks. You know, I take a couple of issues with some of the plot points going on here. But <laughs> anyway, he is trying to make sure that his sister really did die. What? Honorably or no foul play or something like that? or No idea. No idea. So, but then, but then, and and that's and that's basically it. You know, we it's just kind of a mystery around around the wife's death and you know the husband's past and all that. But the stories they were given were just incredible. So apparently, from what he said, the first version was. Well, you know, she just went mad, wandered into my torture room. Ten minutes minute away, wandered into you. my torture room and got herself closed in the Iron Maiden. You know, like happens, you know. All the time. And the brother seemed a bit suspicious of this, but not nearly fucking as suspicious as I, I, I think Warren did. Yeah. No, she just wandered into an Iron Maiden and shut herself in. Sure. Okay. Uh, here's, here's the thing that gets me. I feel like Vincent Price isn't the bad guy here. Yeah. And, like, at the end, they're fighting him. And, like, they kill him. But, like, he was just having a mental episode. Yes. His dead wife came back to life, and he lost his mind and thought he was his dad, his violent dad. Yes. That doesn't mean you have to kill him. He didn't do any of this. But, but see, that's what gives me the problem to begin with. Like, like so you're the brother, like... Isn't your first fucking question like, why do you have a torture room? Yeah. You know, maybe this is the first question. Yeah. You know, and how did she just kind of get herself closed in the Iron Maiden? Was she like a cat getting stuck in the refrigerator? Yeah. What the fuck? Yeah, basically. Well, to be fair, but then we've the all done doctor it. shows up and adds on, "Well, she saw something that was just so frightening that she closed herself in an Iron Maiden." I mean, I've I've wanted to. I that's what I wanted to do after watching Rock of Ages. Yeah. I wanted to lock myself up after watching well, that you... film. You, you, you. Time will still tell on that movie, my friend. Yeah. Uh, that's. We still Bunny's, watch it every Christmas. Bunny's dogma uh Rock of Ages. Just like in Dogma, where. Oh, just like when you said, what would be the better, what would be the more successful film, E.T. or Crush Groove? Hey, time will tell on that one. <laughs> That's what Bunny's doing. He's crush grooving it. Okay, so here's the thing about this film, The Pit and the Pendulum. Um, it's a costume period horror film. It looks pretty beautiful. It's very colorful. It's got like a crazy color palette, despite being cheap as fuck. Um, I think I like this film. Oh, I like this film. I like this film a lot, but I, I find that it's just that is just such a big gaping plot hole. Yeah, like exactly what happened. 
that it's just forgotten about, really. But I feel that when it comes to all of Roger Corman's Edgar Allan Poe adaptations, he got a story, he got a setting, and then he just went off on his own. So when I see this movie and I get confused about the plot, I feel like that's not Edgar Allan Poe's fault. That's fucking doing is making a movie that his budget allows. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, Funny. you're coming back. Funny. I can hear can you. you hear you're kind of lagging. Okay. Okay. Good. 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 Okay. So that's all I've got for this week. Um. But then, okay. But then, but then the whole thing is to mind fuck Vincent Price for reasons I am not clear. So like, that why they the wanted cast. to do that. So, so, the wife faked her death with the help of the doctor who owned the yellow door in the hopes that they could drive him mad and she would be the person who inherits their massive castle. Yeah. Okay. And I'm assuming fortune? Okay. But even still, like, exactly what did you expect to happen here? You wanted to drive him insane. You drove him insane. You had all the clues to know what direction I of insane it, I he would probably go. When I see plot holes, bizarre plot choices like this uh, in this summer, the answer that I come up with in my head is just Chinatown. Like, oh, but there's this plot hole. Why did this character do this? And I'm so confused. Why is this happening? Uh, lay off the shake. <laughs> it's the Corman. <laughs> Yeah, forget it, Jake. It's Chinatown. It's yeah. by any means necessary. It seems. You're lagging out bad now. It seems as if Roger Corman would be one of those people. Uh... So you might want to wrap it up. You know I'd go from rags to I, um, riches. George Weiss and Ed Wood. Man, freaking... Bunny, can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me now? Okay, Jesus. Okay, so let's wrap this up. That's all I've got for this week and the Pope on Film podcast. Next week, it might be a bit difficult. I apologize. It's a Roger Corman summer. They can't all be winners. Uh oh Okay, so next week we will be watching these, two films from these 1960. Are the first two winners. What do you mean all? <laughs> Look, next week we're watching two films from 1963. We'll be watching The Intruder, starring William Shatner. Yeah. And I'm sorry, buddy, but I have to do it. Fucking dementia 13. Oh, God, no. We've got to. We've got oh. to. We've I mean, got the, to do it. The intruder's not bad. The intruder at least has a good heart to it. I've never seen and, that. And, and, and no, William I, Shatner. Willie Shat, I believe, yeah. is how he likes to be called. The Willie Shat. So, yeah, The Intruder and Dementia 13. But I promise you, the rest of the, the rest of the summer is going to be pretty great. This will okay. be, like, the hardest one. God, I think I've only seen Dementia 13 once. It sucked that bad. Yeah, it's pretty bad. But it, 
Coppola. We've got to watch it. We've got to watch it. Yeah. We've we've got to. So uh, that's next week, and it's 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 gonna hurt. But now that I look back at this week, the highs and the lows, the ups and the downs, the Scrooge McDuck tax. The Scrooge McDuck tax. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, Charles Manson almost did an Elmer McCurdy. Yeah. Uh, divorce lawyers. Uh, Barbara Steele. Dick Miller. Dr. Zoidberg. I've got to say, I think this has been a good episode of the podcast. This has been a damn good episode of the podcast. Okay, good. I, I felt the same way, but I didn't want to say that because I feel like you're the one who makes that distinction. But yes, I concur with your assessment. Good, sir. So until next week, I am Bunny Williams. And I am Reverend May Lynn. And on behalf of Natasha and Q and Eleanor and Max and everybody else, I just want to say thanks for listening. And we will see you next week, you godless heathens. And you, and you rich. And you riches? And you poo poo? Oh man, here, here, uh, play me out. Do 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 do